Mr. Tavern Keeper's History of the Old World. Here we go, gentlemen. A couple of bottles of mulled wine, a stone bottle of mulled ale each, and a selection of cheeses. The blue cheeses come from fresh-faced Kislev. The soft cheese is from Bretonia, but the rest are all Estalian. No cheeses from the Empire, though, I'm afraid. My apologies. Imports in general have been a bit uh, hit and miss for about a year now. There seems to be a problem with uh, recruiting and keeping men and women to drive the wagons on those particular routes. It wouldn't be a problem if they paid a decent wage for such dangerous and taxing work. But the merchants that way are greedy and mean, and only think of swelling their own purses. This particular labour shortage is as a direct result of that. I doubt anything will change, though. They have all the provincial officials at their trough, stuffing their fat faces on bribes and favours. Anyway, I do have plenty of homemade dried fruitcake to soak up some of the uh, alcohol and sharpen your senses. I hope that will suffice. Oh, yeah, yeah, my goodness, Master Tavernkeeper, what a feast. Ach, for an impromptu spread. This is amazing. I just hope you're not fattening us up to feed to your pigs. What? <laughs> oh, come on, Heinrich. Not this again. Try not to be too gullible. Oh, I'm just pulling your leg there, Heinrich. Anyhow, let me just have a swig of this here uh, mulled ale. <sighs> oh, it's got quite a... Quite an apple taste. Ah, yes. Well, we call it mulled ale, but it's uh, it's made from cider, really. Ugh, that'll be it then. Delicious, to be true, though. Uh, but uh, I think it's about time we uh, tackled the tragedy of Macbeth. Ah, yes. Please, we place ourselves in your uh, most capable hands. Oh well, I'll try my best. Now. The tragedy of Macbeth was once taught at the seminary as a uh, cautionary tale against the evils of power and civilization, but it, uh, it got touched by so many scholarly hands in verifying its accuracy that it soon transcended these uh, dishonest goals and became uh, an epic story in and of itself. But before I go any further, I do have a question. I don't really know how the story became known beyond the shores of Albion. Perhaps. Master Tavern Keeper, as a fan of the uh, theatrical version, you can shed some light on this. Ah, yes, I can as it happens. Well, the most well-known interpretation was written by the playwright Richard Heelig Brunen of Altdorf, although this was based on various earlier versions that were in circulation in his youth. The rumours go that these have been passed down by word of mouth by the descendants of a group of fishermen of the clan Macarno, hailing from the town of Winwood in your East Albion. Although, even upon hearing these, no one believed that Albion was real. This uh, family of fishermen had apparently become lost at sea and eventually came ashore in Bretonia. There, they settled in the coastal marshes of Old North Moussillon, which are not so dissimilar in nature to Albion from all you've said, Cedric. Anyway, from here the family spread far and wide along the trading routes up and down the coastline of the Old World, taking the tales of their homeland with them as they did so. Oh, well, now that makes a lot of sense. Thanks very much, Septimus. Anyhow, to continue, in essence... The sorry tale of the fall of the House of the King of East Albion was brought about due to the uh, misuse of magic. As I mentioned earlier, Albion is uh, suffuse in the stuff, and even those of little power and knowledge, your hedge wizards, for example, can uh, wield powers well beyond their abilities, 
simply because the winds of magic blow so strongly over the isle. And uh, as my old master, the Venerable Bede, oft used to say, Power without knowledge sees its user embrace falsehood in the cloak of truth and extol the virtues of ignorance as innocence, allowing them to deny the evil that they do. As such, many simple magic users found themselves inadvertently treading the path of dark magic and being corrupted completely by it in both spirit and body. It is these that we call witches, and it is three of these that set the wheels in motion for our tragic tale. But not this alone. They were but marionettes in the great scheme. For behind, the scryers of the truth sayers detected the hand of one of the dark gods, the changer of the ways. You see, a grand fate had been seen for King Donko by some of our uh, purveyors of things yet to be. He was to unify Albion and be both her shield and sword. The famous castles that he and his allies had built were but precursors. Flawed first attempt, if you like, at what was to have been a series of forts and walls all along the entire coastline of Albion. With such, we'd have had uh, no need of the mists that currently protect us. It is also foretold that he would uh, construct a great armada in order to conquer all of Norska and, in doing so, create another bulwark against the great enemy. Oh, yeah, yeah, much like that of Grand Cassés that you told me about, Master Tavern Keeper. Ah, yes, indeed. But, Cedric, what of this skein of fate? I have never heard the like of it. Nor shall you. With the murder of King Dunco, it was cut and cast into oblivion. The great schemer fed false prophecy to the witches in order to corrupt one of the king's lieutenants, Macduff, son of the great hero, Sinel Macduff, the Thane of Glamis, and bring about the doom of Dunco and such a potential future. Sane? What is this Sane? Thane, I think you mean. And it's an old East Albion word for noble. Anyhow, after the death of Dunco, the king's heirs were left to uh, solely focus on petty revenge throughout their lives, and Dunco's great vision lay shattered, cast to the ground, and forgotten. <laughs> when will we three meet again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly burly's done, when the battle's lost and won. That'll be here, the set of sun. Where the place? Upon the heath. There to meet with Macdeath. Hmm? Shouldn't that be pronounced Macdeath? What? Well, it doesn't rhyme, does it? It doesn't have to rhyme. But this was not the only play by the dark god of change, for he also fed power to some of his followers in the land of Norska itself. The shaman sorcerers of Hagtree Cops, who either coerced or murdered their jarls, took control of their tribes and led them on their longships through the treacherous mists of Albion to land in the east of the country. Here, they began to immediately attack the nearby villages up and down the coast. But it was not to pillage, nor for plunder, nor for slaves. Instead, each was given an ultimatum. Join us or die. To their credit, many Albionites refused but was so brutally put to the sword that a wave of fear swept over all of East Albion. Those that could fled to the unassailable caves, or the newly constructed castles of King Dunco and his thanes. Those that could not were either killed or capitulated and joined the Norse, becoming rebels. The secret leader of these rebels was the Thane of Cordor, up on the northern coastline of East Albion. The shamans of the Norse had come to him with a words of seduction, promising him the crown of Albion if he would but side with them. Cordor was a rich and greedy man and quickly threw in his lot with the invaders, who, 
sweetened the deal with loot stolen from the villages that they had razed to the ground. The Norse then split their forces in two, with the smaller going ashore in the north near the castle of Cordor, and the larger portion disembarking in the south at Fife, where they would uh, rendezvous with the majority of the forces of the Thane of Cordor himself later. The plan seems to have been this. The Norse were to feign a siege of the castle of Cordor to deflect suspicion away from the Thane in the hope of drawing Dunk on his armies north to relieve his ally and leave the rest of East Albion undefended. Then, as Dunk's forces began their muster, the Thane of Cordor, with the majority of his army, would secretly move to join the large Norse army at their agreed uh, Pont de Puy, as the Bretonians say, down in Fife, and begin the conquest of East Albion together, unopposed and unstoppable. Once Dunkard realised what was happening, it would be too late. East Albion would be under the thumb of Cordor and his allies, and the army of Dunco would be caught between the rebel forces in the north and the conquering forces of Cordor and the Norse in the south. But the plan completely failed to unfold as expected. Dunco learned of the forces of the Norse gathering in the south through the arcane arts of the divining of his court wizard, Mere Grey Kalkiner, and split his forces accordingly. One army, under the command of the uh, loyal Thane of Ross and his right-hand man Angus, headed south to Fife to face the Norse and, unbeknownst to them, the traitor's army itself. King Dunco then took the rest of his forces, including his two sons, Prince Donalbane and Prince Charlie, and his two closest advisers, Macduss and the wizard Mirgray himself, to Castle Cordor in the north to meet the besieging Norse army. He was, of course, completely unaware of the rebel forces laying hidden in the castle in wait, led by the uh, notorious war chief of the Thane of Cordor, the merciless MacDonwald. The army of Dunco also included Macdeath and his ferocious lieutenant Banquo, both of whom had already made names for themselves, fighting and defeating a marauding army of shipwrecked orcs a year earlier. But uh, more on these later. At the Battle of Cawdor in the north, it seemed that the forces of the Norse and the Albionites were well matched, with Prince Charles leading the vanguard to the very gates of the castle. But it was here that the trap was sprung, and the rebels in the castle came out to join the Norse cutting off the prince's forces from the rest of the army. But, luckily, Macdeath was near at hand, and, seeing the plight of the prince, and with his hearthguard led by Banquo, fought his way through the Norse to join the king's heir. Here, he came upon the treacherous Macdonald as he was attempting to take Charles captive, and, after a bloody duel, cleaved him in two before decapitating him, taking the castle, and displaying the traitor's severed head from its battlements for all to see. What bloody man is that? He can report as seemeth by his plight of the revolt, the new estate. This is the sergeant who like a good and hardy soldier fought against my captivity. Hail, brave friend, say to the king the knowledge of the broil, as thou didst leave it. Ah, doubtful it stood, as two spent swimmers that do cling together. To brave Macdeath, well he deserves a name, disdaining fortune with his brandished steel, which smoked with bloody execution, like Valor's minion carved out his passage till he faced the merciless MacDonald and unseamed him from the navel to the chops and fixed his head upon our battlements. O oh, valiant cousin, worthy gentleman, so well thy words become thee as thy wounds. They smack of honour, both. Go get him, sergeants. Now, unbelievably, at this point, 
It seems that Macdeath was still unaware of the treachery of Macdonald's master and still believed the Fane of Cordor was but elsewhere and loyal. But uh, everyone always used to say that Macdeath wasn't the sharpest tool in the box. Anyhow, at the same time as uh, Duncan was victorious at Cordor, the Battle of Fife was also taking place. The forces of the Thane of Rost took the larger army of the Norse and the rebels by surprise and drove the invaders back to their longships, killing many in the rout. They also captured Cordor himself and took him captive. With the loss of their leader, the back of the rebel army was broken and they fled into the nearby bogs and marshes to be hunted down piecemeal thereafter. The Thane of Ross and Angus left their army to mop up the last of resistance and immediately journeyed back to see King Dunco to see what was done with the uh, treacherous Thane. Who comes here? The worthy Thane of Ross. Whence camest thou, worthy Thane? From Fife, great king, where the Norsemen banners flubbed the sky and fan our people called. Norsk himself with terrible numbers, assisted by that most disloyal traitor, the Thane of Cordor, began a dismal conflict, till the Balana's bridegroom, lapped in proof, confronted him with self-comparisons, point against point, rebellious arm against arm, curbing his lavish spirit, and to conclude, the victory fell on us. Great happiness. No more the fiend of Cordor shall deceive our bosom interest. Go pronounce his present death, and with his former title greet Macdeath. I'll see it done. What he hath lost, noble Macdeath hath won. It was as Macdeath was journeying back to the encampment of the king after the Battle of Cordor, for Dunco had not directly taken part in the battle, that he encountered the three witches upon one of the blasted heaths so common in East Albion. Fair is foul, and foul is fair. Hover through the fucking filthy air. <laughs> fair air, that's better. At least it rhymes. To thee, Thane of Cordor. All hail Macdeath, that shall be king hereafter. All hail to Banquo, lesser than Macdeath and greater. No so happy, yet much happier. Thou shalt get kings, though thou be none. So, so all, all hail Macdeath and, and Banquo. Banquo. Are you talking to me, Jimmet? Stay, you imperfect speakers. Tell me more. By sin of death, I know I am the Thane of Glamis. But how of Cordor? The Thane of Cordor lives. A prosperous gentleman. And to be king. Stands not within the prospect of belief. No more than to be Cordor. Say from whence you owe this strange intelligence. Or why, upon this blasted heath, you stop our way with such prophetic greeting. Speak, Archarja. Ach, typical. You just can't trust witches. And so the witches vanished, leaving Macduff completely incredulous. Until the Thane of Ross too, in search of Macbeth, came to the very same heath. Angus, we are sent to give thee from our royal master thanks, 
only to herald thee into his sight, not pay thee. And for an earnest of a greater honour, he bade me from him call thee Fain of Corridor, in which addition hail most worthy Fain, for it is thine. Can the devil speak true? The Fain of Corridor lives. Why do you dress me in borrowed robes? Who as Thane lives yet, but under heavy judgment bears that life which he deserves to lose. Whether he was combined with those of Norska, or did line the rebel with hidden help and vantage, or that with both he laboured in his country's rack and own not. But treason's capital, confessed and proved, have overthrown him. Ach, it's a strange old world we live in. And so, Macduff became the Thane of Cordor. With this, the evil thought of usurping King Donco too, sunk its teeth into the heart of Macduff, and the fate of Albion changed forever in that very instant. <laughs>